All right. Good afternoon, Bay Area. My name is Michael Guimond, and I'm VP of the West Coast here at BizNow. I'd like to welcome you to today's Bay Area Industrial Advanced Connectivity and Digital Transformations for Industrial Buildings discussion. We'd like to say a special thank you to our audience, as well as our speakers, for joining us today on our new platform, the BizNow webinar. We thank everybody for being so positive and excited to participate during this pretty uneasy time. From all of us at BizNow, I want to say that we're determined to continue to push the commercial real estate industry forward, help you do more business, and bring you cutting edge news and opportunities to learn and connect during this tumultuous time. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Geoverse. They are an amazing company. You're going to hear from somebody at their firm throughout this webinar. If you have any questions on Geoverse, simply shoot me an email after we conclude. I'm at guimond at biznow.com, G-U-I-M-O-N-D at biznow.com. I will connect you with someone from their leadership team. Before I introduce our speakers, a couple of housekeeping items. To all of our attendees, everyone is on mute and without video, as this is a video platform and a lot of us are dialed in from home, you may experience a slight delay. If you do experience a slight delay, please simply log out and log back in since a lot of us are connected around the United States on this today. Q&A, there will be some time for questions for our panel. You can submit them using the Q&A function right next to the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And we will have some live polling throughout this discussion today. Our polls are optional. If you'd like to answer them, please go ahead. My biggest note to all of you right now is don't worry. All of our webinars are recorded. And if you registered for this, you will be emailed a copy of the recording at the conclusion of today's session. Our next webinar is Tuesday, the 26th at 3.30 p.m. And that's our Bay Area Capital Markets webinar with Kristen Milano and Yusuf Freeman and Jeff Burns. Well, enough about that. I'm thrilled to introduce our speakers to you this afternoon. We're joined today by Drew Hess, SVP from Duke Realty, Denton Kelly, Managing Principal from LDK Ventures, Alan Finley from System Engineering and Emerging Technologies of Prologis, and our moderator this afternoon, Rod Nelson, CEO and co-founder of Geoverse. Rod, good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining the webinar today, and thank you, uh, BizNow, for the opportunity to participate here. And my thanks also to our uh, panelists, Alan, and uh, Denton and Drew, and I think we'll have a really interesting conversation here this afternoon. Um, as uh, Mike mentioned, I'm a co-founder and CEO at Geoverse, and at Geoverse, we are a specialized mobile operator that builds, owns, and operates wireless assets for enterprise verticals and carriers nationwide. In short, that means we help to deploy and operate private cellular networks to benefit our enterprise customers uh, uh, to use for their business critical applications. And we also provide a neutral host service that creates a great cell phone uh, experience for all the customers of the tier one operators that would visit our, uh, our enterprise customers facilities. So that's what we do at Geoverse. Um, we're excited to be part of the uh, emerging technologies for um, for the real estate industry across many different verticals, and, and this is one of the most exciting. Uh, I'd uh, probably now invite the, uh, some of our panelists to introduce themselves to the you know, beef, beef background, maybe starting with uh, Alan. How about uh, if you go first? Sure. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. My name is Alan Finley. I'm a Senior Vice President in our technology team at Prologis. Uh, Prologis is the largest logistics real estate company in the world. We have about 900 million square feet of real estate uh, globally in 19 countries. Um, happy to be here. And Denton. Uh, you're on mute though, Denton. There we go. Sorry about that. 
Uh, yeah, uh, thank you everyone for being here today. Denton Kelly with LDK Ventures. Uh, we are a Sacramento-based, uh, NorCal-focused uh, regional developer of industrial and multifamily uh, assets. Uh, we've been around for about uh, 30 years and we own about 10 million square feet of uh, industrial property throughout uh, Northern California. Andrew. Yeah, good to, good to be here today, guys. Good to join you. Uh, I'm Drew Hess with Duke Realty. I am uh, the head of the Northwest region for Duke, headquartered out of Oakland. Um, our region includes the Bay Area, uh, the Central Valley, and Seattle. Duke is a publicly traded real estate company. We've got about 155 million square feet across, uh, across the U.S. We're domestic only, um, and again, happy to be here. All right, well, thank you everyone. So I think to uh, kick things off, um, you know, probably start with a question that's I think on the top of all of our minds, uh, you know, in the, in the last few months and, uh, and that is, you know, what do you think lies in the future for industrial and logistics real estate due to the uh, COVID-19 crisis? Uh, is it gonna uh, drive demand for more or less or just something different? Maybe we can start with uh, Denton for, uh, for a few your thoughts and we'll go around the group. Yeah, I think, I mean, everything we're seeing is it's driving more demand more rapidly. And I, I think that the, uh, the the one thing I, I keep saying about this whole, you know, COVID issue is that it's been the great accelerator of, of pretty much everything. Um, so it's accelerated the demise of retail, but accelerated um, the demand for more industrial. It's accelerated, you know, federal state, local, you know, government um, budget deficit issues. So it's, it's really just kind of brought a lot of things to the forefront that were already, um, you know, in, in the works. And so for industrial, um, you know, there's, there's obviously gonna be big winners and big losers. Industrial seems to be uh, so far uh, the biggest winner. And certainly from a capital markets perspective, whether that's debt or equity, that market's come back um, quicker than anything else. Everything else with multifamilies coming back, but um, industrial really seems to be the, the fair haired child of the market right now that most institutions uh, want and uh, need to own um, in the interim. So um, right now the, the big box industrial is certainly in very high demand uh, because of the e-commerce disruption. Um, the small and medium size, um, I, I, I think the, the multi-tenant small medium size is going to experience some distress in certain markets. Um, Think Vegas, think Houston, um, but I think in general, um, the big box market, the big box market, major market seems to be strong, just about everywhere, without any uh, risk of oversupply that I can see. So, right, great. Well, we'll probably come back to that uh, to that thought uh, in the, a little bit later in the webinar. Drew, what are your thoughts on on the demand side? Yeah, no, I I think this is positive too. There are you know several factors I think that will play into this uh, driving more absorption. Um, you know, the, the acceleration comment from Denton's is just spot on. Uh, so now we've just seen um, more um, e-commerce adoption, right, which clearly does require more, uh, more industrial real estate. Um, but we're going to see it across the spectrum between, you know, more city stations, delivery stations, to larger big boxes as well, and in some of the tertiary areas where you can build bigger product, you know, we've definitely seen that depending on the market above 500 or above 800,000 square feet, um, that the demand actually re remains the strongest. So whether it's more safety stock, we'll talk about that a little bit later too. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to see the, um, we're going to see some reshoring. Uh, we're already seeing some requirements um, that were going to be in China and now stuff that's going to be built, widgets built locally. Uh, so I think it's good news across the board. Uh, and I think specifically, we're going to continue to see um, uh, facilities with larger um, yards, bigger yards, less coverage, and just more functional real estate will continue to do well. Hey, Alan. Yeah, I think you I agree with all the comments made so far. We're, we're seeing the same, same behaviors. We're seeing that you know, a lot of our customers uh, who had a digital presence and platform either as a primary means of distribution or as a secondary means of, of interaction with consumers. Uh, they were able to ramp up quickly. I think that 
is driving uh, more inventories uh, as we move forward, as companies look to shift uh, their supply chain and mitigate risk in the supply chain. I think to, to Drew's point, we'll see more manufacturing move nearshore and onshore, which will also drive demands. And then the, you know, the shifts in the, in the distribution channels are gonna drive um, you know, how do you do faster restocking and then new product in the in infill and, you know, last mile, so. Well, speaking of digital, um, you know, both Target and Walmart announced their earnings this week and the uh, year over year growth on the digital side of their businesses was really breathtaking. Um, you know, obviously they're following a different strategy than Amazon with, you know, using the stores as a fulfillment center um you know i'm sure that it's all good but i mean how does that model uh well, what's the impact of you know since omni channel in general but maybe you can comment a bit on you know this idea of the store as a warehouse versus the you know distribution centers and how does that impact your thinking you start with alan on that one sure well i think that you know a lot of that was driven by uh, in the immediate term was driven by the reaction to, you know, how do we get product to consumer, right? Because that was, that was the disruption point. I can't have consumers come to me. So how do I start to use my stock in my store to provide immediate fulfillment, those micro fulfillment centers? We still have the same challenge, right? I've got to fill my micro fulfillment center from some kind of a distribution source. Um, so going back to our prior point, you know, that, that is going to drive those inventories and that need to do that that quick turn and that quick turnaround. I think that, you know, it remains to be seen. Hopefully this doesn't last forever, but it's certainly not going away tomorrow. Um, that model of being able to provide direct to consumer fulfillment uh, is going to continue. And I think as companies get creative with, you know, I, I, I may not be able to take down additional space immediately. Um, how do I get creative with the footprint that I have now and make, make the best of that? I think Target, Walmart, Whole Foods, uh, Kroger, great examples. Yeah, Drew or Kent Denton, want to jump in on that one? Yeah, you know, uh, the reverse logistics will be continue to be a challenge. I think people are still trying to figure out all of that out, but that has an impact on on space needs. But yeah, I do I do think the um, the omni channel approach um, makes sense for some. I, you know, we're working with a a big uh, retailer that is a, kind of a separate supply chain for. Uh, both its brick and mortar stores and a very robust um, uh, re-engineering of their supply chain for a separate um, um, e-commerce. Uh, and so in the same market, they'll have, they'll have um, traditional retail and they'll have e-commerce. Um, and some of that's transparent to their customers, some of it's not, it can be a little confusing, mm -hmm. but um, you know, I think we're still at the beginning of this and, and, and there's no doubt that there are some of these stores that will just end up being smaller. They'll still have a, uh, they'll still have a traditional presence. And, um, you know, over time, you know, if they can get a little bit smaller and take product back there or have people be able to look at colors or try things on, I think that's still, there's still gonna be a demand for that. But, um, uh, but we are seeing, we're seeing this big movement to, um, you know, e-commerce. Mm -hmm. So then I think your your company has some mixed use properties. So how do you see the puts and takes on this between the retail space and the distribution space? Well, I mean, traditional brick and mortar, you already had all the storerooms that were already kind of, you know, getting smaller because they didn't need them because it was becoming omni-channel, like a, a restoration hardware. You go in, you, you can't even buy anything off the floor of a restoration hardware showroom anymore. It's just, it's the, it's the front end consumer experience, right? Um, and at the same time, you had people that were 100% online that were starting to develop brick and mortar because they realized their total sales did better with some brick and mortar, even if it was just 10, 20% of their sales. And so, um, you know, overall, I think that trend just continues. Um, I think the difference between Amazon and Walmart and Target is, is interesting to see how that plays out because they're trying to leverage existing fi fixed asset investment, which makes sense. And, you know, Amazon's building it out from scratch. Um, there's probably room for all three players, which one ultimately is the higher margin, more profitable business, you know, the time will tell. Um, but I think as far as, you know, I, I have specific examples I see. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, I think we've lost Denton. 
Um, that's a pity. Um, hopefully we'll get him back. Um, but while we're on the topic of retail, um, there's been a lot of um, high visibility bankruptcies, uh, JC Penney and Neiman Marcus and so on. Um, how does that impact what you guys see? Drew? Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. I was just thinking back, um, I used to, uh, we got Denton back. Sorry. Um, used to work for Allen's CEO, who in 99 sold all of the retail assets we owned because he was worried about the internet um, basically wiping out retailers. And, uh, and he was right. I mean, at, at some point, right, um, we're seeing that carnage now. It may have been a little early to sell that retail portfolio. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, the, the uh, still, right, focusing on logistics, that was, uh, he made that call in 98, 99 um, to, uh, to just focus on logistics real estate for, for this reason. So I, I think the retail play here is kind of interesting. We're, we're looking at some of these um, low coverage retail, uh, you know, big box retail, uh, by definition, is about 25% coverage. And, you know, the size of these stores and the size of some of these parcels if you can run, get through the city gauntlet, you know, they may not want to see these things turn into delivery stations. But, um, you know, I think we will see some of these re sites recycled. We're seeing that in Southern California with um, mm -hmm. some old fries and some old um, Costco's. And um, so, you know, we're, we're at the beginning of that. I, I, I didn't verify this. I heard today that was it Amazon's buying AMC. The movie theaters, yeah, I heard that they're in discussions, right? Yeah, but, uh, so I yeah, that's, that's an example where sure. just exactly what Drew's talking about. They could, it's basically could be an adaptive reuse of some of those boxes, or it could just be a complete, an infill play on dirt that they just want to own and control for the sake of their, their last mile efforts. Right. Yeah, you were going to make a point uh, earlier, Denton. Uh, you had a specific example you were uh, going to talk about, and then we got... Uh, Freezing. No, it was just, it, it was just a, you know, the, the, uh, basically like the home decor and furniture business, that industry, that we have two tenants, one that's doing well, that has a you know, vast majority of sales are online. And on the other hand, we have more of a regional credit who hasn't a, really adapted to the times and he's all brick and mortar and he's struggling, right? And so yeah. it's just, I think it's hard to see how retail works without an online presence. I, in fact, I just, I don't think it does. You can't be competitive. No, that's yeah. that's clear, right? From what we're yeah. seeing in the in yeah. the results through this, and um, but I was just thinking we're probably going to need some place where we can send our autonomous vehicles to go pick up our uh, packages for us and bring them home. So that could be a good use of some of this, uh, you know, retail uh, retail area. Um, another question I was, uh, of course, that's very dear to me, um, you know and the technology side of things. And maybe I'll start with Alan on this one. Um, you know, what kind of you know, technology services are your tenants using? And what do they need more of? Sure, yeah, they're, uh, you know, post COVID, I think a lot of our customers are gonna be looking at how do they embrace automation to drive some efficiencies in their operations. Um, you know, be able to keep up with the online, the e-commerce demand, especially for those companies who've are making that transition into e-commerce. Um, I think, you know, frequent conversations around autonomous vehicles, um, wireless networking, uh, in actually technology footprints inside a warehouse, you know, for, for you know, 3PLs, it's pretty common for them to input a, three, a, a technology footprint, um, but there's a lot of customers that don't. And so how do they start embracing that technology? I think that it, it's, uh, it's time and capital intensive. So part of that discussion with our customers is how do we help you with that? Um, but I think to, to right. be successful moving forward post COVID, you're, you're gonna have to leverage some, some form of technology. Yeah, I would think that you probably all have some uh, old economy tenants, you know, within your portfolios, right? So it's how can we help them um, keep up uh, or if if we don't help them keep up, it may be hard for them to stay around. Um, you know, any thoughts on the tech side, Drew? You know, not really. We we um, we're definitely seeing a need for more power. Um, almost all the requirements come in with with a, a, a need for more power now. Um, um, I was going to make a joke about bandwidth. I mean, whether you're at home or at work, we all need more <laughs> bandwidth now. Yeah. Um, 
but I do think, yeah, we're, the warehouses are getting smaller um, and it's a, it's a hot topic. I think prop tech has a lot of room to run, uh, a lot of innovation coming. Right, that, on, the, on the tech side, on the industrial side, we just I haven't seen a lot of um, interaction with tenants in that regard. I mean, it's really just what, what Drew spoke to is really things like power, bandwidth, things of that nature. On the industrial side, it really falls more, in our experience today, on the tenant you know, within their own fixturization, whether it's the RF technology or however they handle their tracking their inventories. But um, yeah, we, we haven't had a whole lot of interface in that regard on the industrial mm -hmm. side. Well, I want to come back uh, Denton, to something you mentioned earlier, and that is, uh, you know, a question of whether the industrial market is going to uh, bifurcate between large, uh, well-capitalized tenants and smaller uh, mixed credit tenants. Um, you know, are they both going to do well because the industrial is generally doing well? Or do you think one segment uh, may go up and the other down? Or uh, what are your thoughts on that, Denton? I think there's, there's two. There's there's large, good credit tenants, right? There's small, there's small spaces that also take those tenants. So it's not just that it has to be a big box and a good credit tenant, but in general, the big box credit market is kind of where the most of the deal flow is. But when you get into the multi-tenant space, your credit gets mixed, right? So you can have twenty thousand foot tenant that's a local regional credit that's, you know, supplying the casinos in Vegas, and then you could have a twenty thousand foot tenant right next door that's you know, an a, an a credit that you don't have to worry about. So it's just it's just more of a mixed bag. Um, and I think in general, what you're likely to see, at least from the capital markets, is that more there's there's more of a flight to safety. So you have a very, you're gonna end up with a very barbell market. Where there's a, an extraordinary amount of capital that was previously chasing the big box credit class A market. And there's gonna be even more now. And a lot of that money is gonna be coming out of the multi-tenant market because of that, uh, that flow and flight to safety. And so, I, I generally think where there's going to be more, I'd call them entrepreneurial opportunities, which is kind of really what we uh, tend to pursue, is going to be more, um, you know, one in the development side for big box, but two in the, the acquisition of existing multi-tenant industrial product in, in more distressed markets. And I, I think Northern California should probably weather the storm quite well in that regard. Um, so. Right. I guess there's a, you know, challenges are also opportunities depending upon who's owning and who's buying. I want to go past uh, Drew and Alan on your thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, tenant size, uh, I think, is important. I think it's an important differentiator for our portfolio. We are uh, a much larger average tenant size um, and, and newer buildings on average. And so the portfolio is, is performing very well. Um, we are uh, obviously uh, talking to a lot of customers right now. We're concerned overall we're concerned with the small tenants too and we don't necessarily have that exposure um in all of our markets um uh, but um you know we are we're pulling we're, we're pulling for everybody um and and the experience has been the larger tenants uh so far have have been able to uh weather this a little bit stronger and it is probably a function of uh, what denton said is you know, you know on average the the credit is better but um you know small tenants are an important part of our overall economy right and it's important we still do business with those folks and and um, support them, right? Uh, so hopefully, um, hopefully I'll weather the storm here. I yeah, I've got a follow up on that, but Alan wanted to get yeah, your broad, reaction. Broadly, in our portfolio, you're seeing. I mean, it's kind of a mixed bag. We're we're seeing we're seeing large customers that are having a hard time. You know, those that are able to adjust, just like we're seeing smaller ones, but. Generally, our pro portfolio is pretty distributed, so we're not heavily weighted in one sector or another. So we're not, you know, we don't have a, a high level of risk based on a particular industry. But we're, you know, some some big customers are doing well, and some aren't, and some small ones are doing well, and some aren't. So it it just depends. I think a lot of it comes back to what we said earlier: is those that have a digital presence that were able to adapt quickly, but also the the product mix they have to offer and what their, their go-to-market strategy is um, has either helped them or it's hurt them. Yeah, I mean, as a follow-up, I was just thinking, I mean, it's hard to say, of course, but, you know, from, from us on the, in the industry side, I mean, are there any things we could think of, you know, what could we do to help? Is it that they need to, you know, understand how to, you know, turn their inventory faster or they need to reduce their 
cost of you know getting things in and out of the distribution centers or you know any ideas of what 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 kind of help would those smaller tenants or people that are not uh, already having a digital platform what if we could bring them something what might that be well the one I mean the one thing I would just say is that the one thing we've done has been really proactive to help them early on with you know the government PPP loan program no that's just a band-aid that's not some sort of a sustainable strategy that's going to make them stronger and you know ultimately survive but it was a way of helping our tenant mix where they, they may not have the banking contacts or the resources or the know-how to get that and so that was one thing we did early on but you know beyond that it's really just you know the way we look at it I mean, we own real estate we, we lease buildings and we try to be as flexible as possible in a way that you know doesn't you know damage our own position and, and that's really kind of what we can do and if, to the extent there's resources we can point them to we, we try to help but uh oh you know, I think I'll, we have uh, the same the same problem there, uh, Drew. It looked like you were going to say something. Yeah, I, I mean, I just add that you know, right now our customers are our, are our uh, focus. You know, that's our number one priority right now. So we're we're talking to everybody right now. We're um, you know good good access. You know, from the CFO to the real estate directors. You know, we're um, just kind of staying in tune with them and what what they're seeing. And so I think that's the most important thing that we just have that we kind of keep that customer focus and work through this with them. Yeah, yeah Pilaj is very much the same. Um, high touch with our customers, talking to every one of them. How do we help? How can we help you through this? Because you're right, it's in everybody's best interest if we can help them get through this. Um, it's a, it's a long-term relationship, not a short-term. Yeah. You know, I heard an interesting term this week on TV, uh, someone called the just-in-case inventory instead of just in time inventory um you know uh, <laughs> the obvious reference being you know people are going to stock up because they don't want to be caught short um and my question you know is you know from your from your view of the market i mean how quickly might that happen that people would expand these inventories and how quickly do you think it might go away you know once we get to the other side of this and and you know we have a vaccine or other mitigating techniques where you know where it's not like the past three months. I don't. I don't. I don't think it's just a. It's. I. I don't think it's just a short-term uh, thing, right? I think there's a certain fragility that's been exposed within the global supply chain and our reliance on certain foreign countries or China or what have you. And I. I, I, I just think companies are willing to commit more working capital to inventory now, and they're just going to have to. It'll be lower margin result, but at least they'll have the product to sell. And there's, you, you know, you have to you spend a life, you know, trying to earn the trust of a customer. And it only takes, you know, one experience to lose one, right? And so I think they're just going to be focused on on that surety of retaining those customers and having the inventory. Yeah, I, th I think it was pretty painful uh, for for some of our big customers to run out of certain inventory, right? And I think you know there will be a lo a long term impact there. Um, it's just interesting though, our, our whole careers, right? We've been hearing about just in time and um, the, yeah. the tools that are now becoming available to do that better, to manage your inventory in route are, are, are now here. But the, you know, the impact, uh, the positive impact that that's gonna have is gonna be mitigated by the need to simply have more uh, stuff around, have that safety stock around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's really been a, it's a sudden business continuity exercise to figure out how do we keep from being disrupted again in the future and, and how to, I, but I think the balance that cus, customers are going to go through is finding that right balance between inventory and sales so that they're not, they didn't go the opposite direction, right, where they've got too much inventory and too much space, um, but it, it's going to take time. Uh, and how long will it last? I, I agree with with uh, Denton and Drew, I think I don't think this is a this is a long term play. It's not a short term one. We got to well, put something a, to disagree you know, on. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it's it's a thirty year. It was a thirty year journey towards uh, or a secular trend towards more globalization. Um, it's a little bit uh, uh, difficult for me to think that's going to you know c completely turn around and we'll have a thirty year trend of uh, 
of deglobalization, but um, you know, I think in the next couple of years, the shock has really, you know, been immense, and, and people want to want to um, you know protect themselves from that happening. Certainly, you know, in this fall or or next spring or next winter, um, you know, thinking of also long term changes. Um, which I kind of, um, you know, wonder, you know, whether, you know, this will, will turn around back again. But I mean, the whole work from home idea, right? It, everyone's uh, seeing that it's going to be at least uh, a greater portion of the work experience for more people. Um, and I'm wondering how that, I think, you know, uh, Denton, your company does some multi, uh, multi dwelling units. Um, or just from your general experience, I mean, what do you think that impact's going to be on the layout of people's homes? Well, I, th I mean, I think first and foremost, I just have to. I mean, I, I've accepted the fact that I think the work from home dynamic is it's a real long term impact that you know corporate America woke up in a matter of months and realized this this ecosystem of software and hardware and technology that have been put, put in place in the cloud um, had never been put to the test. Um, and we've been forced to put it to the test of could you really put an entire workforce uh, to work remotely in a productive fashion. And this kind of global situation, which has become kind of an experiment on this work from home thing, has proven that you can. Now, it, it's not black and white. It's more nuanced in terms of what the long-term consequences are. But when you see Twitter, Facebook, Nationwide Insurance, Morgan Stanley, you know, go down the list of people that are saying they're shut down to the end of the year. They might be shut down to 21. They're saying you... 50%, 100% of the workforce will be able to work from home or remotely long term. Um, I think it has very significant impacts to big city markets uh, for office for multifamily demand. And I think it has very huge impacts on the positive side for secondary markets that are more affordable, cool enough, West Coast. Um, and then, you know, how does that inform design? You know, could you see more common area amenity in urban multifamily buildings that have, you know, kind of more you know, it used to be the business center, you know, it was then the WeWork model, that's kind of gone. And so what is it going to be? I don't know, but I think you're going to provide more amenity, more Wi-Fi. You might start building units that actually have dens. So a studio with a den or a one bedroom with a den. Um, so someone has a desk with workout. So if, so that's, that's kind of the way we see it playing out. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing that, uh, you know, makes me think that some of these announcements are a little bit knee jerk and, and that the long term or even medium term impl implications of, of, of running an entire workforce permanently from home is, you know, obviously in our common experience here, I'm sure we've been on a lot of conference calls and we get to see a lot of people's kitchens or their <laughs> living rooms. Um, you know, on this call of panelists here, we're all in a private space uh, without uh, children and animals, uh, you know, walking through the background. Um, but, you know, a lot of my colleagues in our company, you know, don't have that setup. Um, yeah, so you, just didn't, you, you just didn't see the kids, that's all. Yeah, they, yeah. Uh, they, <laughs> they came in, they hit the floor, they walk this way, and then they pop up on the other side. Uh, well, they're <laughs> we got this all down. Yeah. Well, Zoom the, trained. The work from home, <laughs> the work from and home by the way, the kids now are helping, helping set this up. I mean, I, I've seen a whole different level of of um, from from my nine year old daughter, um, kind of schooled me on how this all kind of works. It's it's pretty amazing um, the experience there. Um, you know, I, I wanted to jump in one thing on the office because I think it's interesting. Not everybody is jumping at at remote first work kind of workforce opportunity. Um, there are some that are itching to get back to the office, and this is actually confirmed that they want to be a um, office first company. And so, you know, it may not be for everybody, and then the, but those people that do will probably need more space. Uh, so there, mm -hmm. there's some mitigating factors to that. That, and I don't know how we play that, but play how that plays out. But there's clearly, like Denton said, there's there are companies that are that are saying, "Wow, this this does work," and we put our 400 associates online and remote with, without a glitch, and and we were all surprised. Um, and, it, and, and we can do this again if we need to, but as a company, we, we want to go back to the office as an example, um, because we do like that collaboration that happens. So right. anyway, it's going to be interesting to see. Well, I'm thinking of, you know, the Google uh, 
was in the news a few weeks ago saying that uh, employees could not uh, reimburse the expenses for snacks at home. You know, well, hey, I get free <laughs> snacks in the office. Uh, why shouldn't I get free snacks when I'm, you know, working at home? But uh, it seems like there would be, you know, that's a kind of maybe trivial example, but, you but know, who pays for the broadband? Who pays for all this stuff? And uh, But Alan, I think you were going to jump in on this topic. Yeah, I think there's a, a couple of dynamics there. I, th I was going to bring up the point about, you know, how are things paid for? So a lot of companies that have been, been doing work from home for a long time will generally have a program in place where they've got an agreement with employees. We'll give you a set amount of money for, you know, to buy a laptop or pay for internet or that kind of thing. So I think that's part of what companies are having to think about. How do they help their employees? Are we going to provide them equipment at home? But I think the other thing that we're all learning um, this is a great example is, you know, the Zoom fatigue. Um, we're on meetings. Our, our workday is much longer, even though you've eliminated a commute and you've eliminated some of the other dynamic that, you know, air quotes, a normal day used to look like. Uh, but it introduces new challenges. And also in this environment, uh, as Drew was pointing out, you've got kids at home. You've got uh, techn technology challenges. I know that, you know, we, we move 1,600 people remote uh, to work from home around the world almost overnight, and, and it worked beautifully, but, you know, you've got people that have really very broad, varying degrees of uh, internet access at home. I'm fortunate because I have really high bandwidth and throughput. That's great. I have colleagues that they're lucky if they get 10 meg. Uh, yeah. And, and in that environment, they've got their, they're on a video call, their kids are playing online games, they're, or they're streaming movies, and, you know, it puts a real burden on there. And to Denton's point, I think what you'll see in residential is it's going to really push a, a need for the internet providers and technology providers to provide ubiquitous service to people. Yeah, well, that, uh, that's part of what we do, so that's uh, that's good. I got an interesting question from the audience here that uh, I want to have Denton and Drew start out with, um, and that is, you know, what would a Tesla departure mean for uh, industrial demand in the Bay Area? Yeah, I, yeah, that's it's a it's a good question. I think we um, we went through this scenario when Numi. Uh, almost uh, shut down. So uh, Numi was the uh, plant that Tesla uses now, uh, went offline in 2010. It was a JV, I think, between Toyota and GM. And they went offline in, in 2010. And, and we thought, oh my God, you know, we lost 2,500 employees and the whole uh, supply chain, you know, the ecosystem around that plant. And wouldn't you know it, Tesla popped up within, within the same calendar year, rolled a car off that line and I think the reason why they don't leave is, is because they only paid $50 million for several million square feet and a couple hundred acres. And guess how many people work there now? It's about 10,000 people now, even with all the automation. And it's, it's actually a full meme if you go by and look at how these guys park there. Um, they park illegally. They park everywhere. Um, and, and I don't think they're going anywhere. I think they kind of, you know, Elon kind of brushed the city and the county back off the place. Yes, well, <laughs> right. So, so they didn't even, I, I just, you know, they could absolutely happen. And, you know, we, um, and, and it is a risk for Bay Area. There, there are uh, millions of square feet of suppliers that we have, we have risk for. So I don't want to pretend like it couldn't, it couldn't happen, but it's a tight enough market that I think somebody will step back in um, and or will will absorb it the old fashioned way, um, you know, one one box at a time. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I've heard similar uh, rumors as recently as yesterday um, from some certain execs. And um, I mean, if it happened, it would be a would not be a good day just because the supply chain runs so deep and, and drives a lot of demand all the way into the Central Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, Lathrop, Livermore, uh, we even have some users up here in Sacramento now. Um, you know, could it be absorbed? Yes. Would it take time? Yes. Um, they were kind of like Amazon for a while. They were kind of one of the two big users gobbling up the most space for a couple of years. Um, their their appetite seems to have slowed um, while Amazon's has continued at a voracious appetite. So I, I do think it could get absorbed, but it, it might take a couple few years. It would definitely create some just softness in the market, but I don't think it would be, um, you know, kind of the catastrophic 
um, you know, gut punch, if you will, kind of like the, the what the energy sector is to Houston type thing. Right, um, right. But uh, it, would, it would create some softness, but hopefully it doesn't happen. Yeah, that's interesting stuff. Um, I think we're coming uh, up on a few minutes uh, here. Um, maybe just want to go around the group and, you know, what are, what are some other thoughts that you didn't get a chance to, to uh, maybe uh, tell the audience about, maybe starting with Alan. I, I think the, uh, the emphasis around and the consumer behavior moving forward will have a lot to do with, you know, all the things that we've talked about. How does that influence uh, dem consumption, demand, and then how companies are able to respond to that? Um, you know, a lot of that's unknown. It's going to be determined by, you know, how long does COVID stick around? What are the social distancing requirements going to look like? But I think the long story is that demand doesn't change. It just changes form. And the companies that are able to adapt to the, the change in, in environment, um, they'll meet that demand. And I think industrial's going to be healthy for a long time is, is my point of view on it. Denton? Uh, I would lar largely share, um, you know, Alan's sentiments. And I, I think that, you know, the, the aggregate demand while right now is down quite a bit given the high rates of unemployment, um, his comments generally right. The demand broadly doesn't change. It just kind of shifts around based upon consumer behavior and um, industrial is going to continue to be the largest beneficiary of that um, change in behavior. And so, yeah, that's about it. Drew. Yeah, just uh, one quick thought on the, the work from home piece. We just, I think a part of the conversation that hasn't been had yet is what do people get paid when they work from home, you know, when they, when they move from the Bay Area to Boise, you know, they don't, yeah. you don't, you don't get to keep your <laughs> Bay Area salary. Uh, and I don't, I don't think we've all kind of factored that in quite yet, but, um, but just in, in closing, um, you know, we're, we're very bullish. Uh, we're very bullish on the industrial space. Uh, the company is strong. We got a great balance sheet. We um, we're looking for land, you know, we're looking for opportunities to grow still. And so, um, you know, long, long term, we, uh, we believe in the space and um, are excited to grow the portfolio. All right. Well, I think, uh, you know, again, thanks, everyone. Um, you know, here at Geoverse, uh, we would be excited to work with you or your tenants. Um, we believe that the technology services that, uh, that we create can help them make the uh, transition from old world economy to new world economy and adapt to the a changing environment and uh, we'd love the opportunity to help wherever and however we can. Um, Mike, I guess I should maybe turn it back to you for any closing remarks to close us out here or? Amazing. How do we go? Oh, Rod, thank you for, uh, for leading such an important discussion right now. Um, folks, if you're tuned in, that's, that's the end of our programming for today. Uh, we'll resume on Tuesday, the 26th at 3.30 p.m. with our Capital Markets Update. Kristen Milano, Yessa Freeman, and Jeff Bruns. Uh, a big thank you. Uh, today goes out to Geoverse, along with our speakers, Drew Hess, Denton Kelly, Alan Finley, and obviously our moderator, Rod Nelson, for, uh, for talking about something that is so pertinent to the Bay Area. If you have any questions about our platform or about Geoverse, shoot me an email. Other than that, gents, have a wonderful afternoon. All Thanks. right. Goodbye. Have a great uh, Memorial Day weekend. You as yeah. well. Thanks, guys. Take care. Stay yeah. safe. Bye Thanks. now.